Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, Hope Nation. Good morning, family and friends. Listen, I'm gonna give a few a little moment for folks to jump on here. Do me a favor as you're coming on. Uh like, tag, and share. Uh type some folks' names in the chat. It is Sunday morning. Hope Nation is on the air. Um, we do have pop-up prayer today, so I'm not gonna be on here real long because I'm gonna get over to the park for pop-up prayer. Um, but I want to just say good morning to everybody. Um, and uh, we're going to have a word from the Lord and then we're going to be out of here because we're going to get ready for prayer in the park. Um, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, those on YouTube and on Facebook, God bless you all. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning to everybody that is streaming and tuning in. Um, good morning. Do me a favor again. Please tag and share as you're coming on here. Uh, tag and share, like, tag and share, type some names in the chat, tag some folks, invite them on, and let them know that we're on and we're live. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to, uh, good morning, Sister Kyle, bless you. Good morning, uh, Sister Margaret, over on YouTube. Um, I'm going to pray, and then um, we're going to dive in and, and get going today. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence that's already here and already moving. God, thank you for this season. Thank you for, uh, thank you, God, for this season of possession. Thank you for this season of promise and potential. Thank you, God, that this season is not like other seasons. This time is not like other times. Thank you, Lord, that we stand in the place, according to Isaiah 43, that you're doing a new thing in us, and now it springs up. We thank you for that which you're causing to spring up in this season. We thank you for the season of suddenlies. We thank you that even as we've been declaring this last week, we expect a sudden, supernatural, miraculous intervention of God. Lord. So we declare that we expect you to intervene and move uh, suddenly, supernaturally, and miraculously. So God, we just bless you. We stir our expectation. We stir our faith. Uh, and we place our hope in you and you alone. We thank you, God, for this time now. Uh, now, God, we ask that you open up your revelation to us. Open up your insight. We thank you uh, for your word, God. We thank you that there's life in your word. We thank you for your will, God, that you are establishing your will in the earth. You're establishing your will in us. And we thank you for this season, God. We just give you honor and the praise. Now, God, we pray that the, your people would be blessed by your word today. We pray that people would be transformed. Shape us by your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Listen. Uh, all right. We're going to jump in and get ready from here. Good morning. Good morning from North Carolina. All those that are um, tuning in. If you're watching outside of Chicago, uh, let me know. Uh, drop something in the chat just to say where you're watching from. All right. Uh, I'm not going to prolong it too much longer. Uh, we're going to get ready and jump in here. La uh, I wanted to say this. Uh, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Do me a favor. Keep tagging some folks names in the chat. Uh, type some folks' names in the chat. Share this if you have not shared it already. A um, couple things again today at noon. So in less than an hour, we got prayer in the park. So if you're in Chicago, meet us at 5575 uh, Lakeshore Drive. Uh, we got prayer pop-up prayer in the park. We're going to be praying uh, for that hour. And then we're going to um, have a lunch, just a little meetup, uh, fellowship time. Uh, so meet us today if you're in Chicago. Um, and then remember first Sunday in September. So two weeks from today, we will be in person. Uh, first Sunday in September, meet us live and in person at 119th and King Drive for Sunday morning worship. Uh, I see God bless you from Atlanta. Uh, those that are tuning in. So we got Atlanta, we got North Carolina. I see you all in the other states. God bless you all. Um, so, uh, Sunday, September 4th, that is the first Sunday in September. Uh, we will be uh, worshiping on the first and third Sundays in person. So make sure you're with us um, on the first Sunday in September. You don't want to miss that Sunday, 1230. Remember, we won't be worshiping at 11. We'll be at 1230, first Sunday in September. You'll see the flyer coming out soon. Meet us there, first Sunday in September. And we'll be meeting on the first and third Sundays um, beginning September. All right. Um that's it by way of announcement. Also, for those who have been part of the book club, I've been hearing testimonies of how people are being blessed on the Thursday book club. I'm glad that, uh, thank you to Elder Nicole for leading that and spearheading that. And um, I pray that you all are continuing to be blessed by that and, and growing in your faith and in your prayer lives as we as you study that. All right. Um, 
I'm going to jump in here uh, in the book of Joshua. I'm going to pick up where I left off last week. Last week, I began dealing with uh, the subject of how to enter in how to enter in. I want to kind of pick up on that today. Uh, we've been dealing with Joshua because one of the things that I've been saying is that we're in this season where I, as I began to declare on the first Sunday of this month on the stream, according to Isaiah, that uh, that he says, Isaiah 43, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The, but the, the thing, the key here is that if as we're in the month of August, this if we're still in the month of August, this is the eighth month of the year. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So we are in the month of new beginnings. We're in the month of fresh starts. We're in the month of sudden shifts. And as we're in this month, uh, one of the things that we, we continue to ask is how do we step into this thing? When God does a new thing, uh, you, you have to be prepared to step into the thing. And, and one of the, what I mean by that is when you step into the new, uh, the scripture talks about for, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. One of the things that we have to understand is that when old things pass away and things become new, there is a new posture that is required. There are new habits and behaviors that are required. And so as we're in this month of the new and we're in this month of stepping into the new, how do we posture ourselves to really walk into this thing? So I've kind of titled the last couple of weeks, last week and this week, how to enter in. Uh, and when, when you want to talk about taking possession and stepping into new seasons and moving into what God has really promised you and declared for your life uh, and for your future, uh, you got to know how to enter into the thing. Because the, the scripture says the promises in God are yes and amen. But that does not mean that God just automatically just drops a promise in your lap and, and you just live happily ever after. You have to know how to handle the thing that God has entrusted into your hands. You have to know how to step in to what God is doing. Uh, there is a way by which we partner with God. Let me say that again. Uh, when God moves in the earth, God moves with and through people. And so we have to partner with God in what God is doing. And, and if we fail to partner with God and what God is doing, we can miss a moment. We can miss a season and miss a window. And so uh, we got to know how to enter in. So last week I dealt with a few things as it pertains to this from the book of Joshua, how to enter in. Uh, I, I talked about uh, unexpired promises. I, I talked about Joshua chapters, uh, chapter three, uh, chapters two and three, rather, uh, when the, when Joshua sent spies into the land uh, and, and they encountered Rahab. One of the things that I said is that Moses had sent spies. This was not the first time that they had gone to spy out the land. Moses sent spies, but Joshua learned a lesson by, Mo by what happened when Moses sent them in. He sent in 12 and only two came back with a good report. Joshua only sent in two. So he says, listen, I only need two who are going to agree because I don't need the other 10 coming back speaking doubt. I'm not going to go through all of that. We talked about that last week. And Rahab was an unlikely alliance. This is the season, y'all, where God will sometimes give you unlikely alliances, meaning that the people whom God uses in your life in this season may not be the people you expect. God may raise up other people. Uh, Mordecai told Esther in the book of Esther, he said, God is able to raise up help from somewhere else. But who knows if you're called to the kingdom for such a time as this? In other words, God can use a multitude of people. God can raise up help from other places. Uh, God desires to use us, but he doesn't have to use us, meaning us uh, individually. God has to use people because he set it up in the earth. He said in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion in the earth. So the dominion mandate of God is that he gave man dominion in the earth. He didn't give animals dominion in the earth. He did not give uh, plants dominion in the earth. He gave it to man, humankind, uh, men and women. We operate in dominion in the earth. And one of the things is many times we live beneath our covenant privilege with God because we don't operate in dominion. And I just want to, this is not in my notes, but I want to ask you today, what is it in the in your life that God is telling you, you got to take dominion over it? There are some things that you're going to have to take dominion over because God has given dominion to you. One of the worst things that we can do is uh, to have dominion over stuff, but not operate in our dominion. Uh, it is the equivalent of you uh, handing over control of your house and, and you, uh, here it is, you paying the mortgage, you pay the rent, uh, it's, it's in your name, but you don't, you don't 
operate in dominion in there. And you 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 let your kids run the house. You let the dog run the house. You let the cat run the house. You 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 just have handed over dominion. And God does not desire. It's not the heart of God for you to operate outside dominion. Now, does that mean you can do whatever you want whenever you want? No, that is rebellion. Uh, but re the difference between rebellion and dominion is submission. Okay, let me say that again. I'm not trying to get too deep today. The difference between rebellion and dominion is submission. Because dominion operates in authority, but is still submitted to God. Rebellion seeks to take authority and doesn't even consider God. Okay. Is this making sense to y'all? Uh, I, I, I want to break this down a little bit. Um, rebellion, the Bible says in, in 1 Samuel, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Uh, and witchcraft, you know, is not just some person, some the old lady sitting in black, uh, over a pot and chanting something. Uh, witchcraft or the spirit of witchcraft at its core is the spirit of manipulation, domination, and control. Um, and so witchcraft operates through manipulation and domination, which is why you got to be careful that you do not become a blind witch by being manipulative all the time and trying to dominate everybody and everything. Uh, and so when you operate in rebellion, you are operating in witchcraft uh, because it is not it is illegal authority. It is unsubmitted authority. It is authority outside the boundaries by which God ordained and designed. God designed things, but he gave us boundaries to operate within. Uh, God gave us uh, uh, limitations on some things to do. And he says, I'm giving you the authority and dominion, but here's your here's your boundaries. Here are the uh, here are the ways in which you're supposed to carry this dominion and authority out. But when you operate in rebellion and witchcraft, you ignore God's boundaries and God's guidelines. Now, dominion says, I'm going to submit to God, but I'm going to operate in the bold authority that God has given me, but I'm going to remain submitted. You have to remain submitted to God as you walk in dominion. So when, so when Joshua and the children of Israel are taking possession of the promise of the land of promise that God has given them, he's doing so under the submission of God. He's not just saying, okay, this is my land. I'm going to go in and do whatever I want to do. No, he's doing it under submission to God. I need somebody to type in the comment section, submission, submission. And I know that word submission, uh, we, we, we often use it only in the context of, of marriage and, and, and that kind of thing, where it's like, you know, a wife submit to your husband. Uh, but submission is not just I'm do what I say. The word submission is a compound word. It is submission. It means and, and th that sub means something that goes under or gets under. A submarine goes underwater, right? A subway goes underground. So submission means to get under or come under the mission, right? So if I am submitted to God or if I walk in submission to God, I come under the mission of God, right? So uh, and this is important now. Uh, ladies that, that are seeking marriage and, you know, if, if, if the man that you marry, you want to marry, if he says, are you going to submit to me? You ask him, what is the mission? Uh, you, you, because if there is no mission, there cannot be submission. All right. Let me say that again. If there is no mission, there cannot be submission. There has to be a mission to submit to. So when we operate in submission to God, that means we come under the mission of God. Right. Uh, it's not about our mission. We don't just come up with our own mission. Uh, now, I know that we all have individual assignments and purpose in the earth, but you don't just come up with a mission that is contrary to the mission of God. So when you operate in submission, you come under the mission of God. What was the mission of God in the book of Joshua? The mission of God was that the children of Israel would go in, possess the land of promise and occupy it and become fruitful in the land. So because they were already lined up under submission to God, they could operate in their full dominion and authority because they're not operating in illegal in illegal authority there are some people who usurp authority or who operate in illegal uh authority and as, as i said that's rebellion and witchcraft so you don't just go and decide i'm gonna just take over stuff no you just you ask god what is your mission what is your heart and then let me line up under your mission so 
And in Joshua chapters four and five, which is one where I want to kind of focus on today, uh, there's a couple of things that Joshua did. One of the things that I said last week is that Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves today because tomorrow the Lord is going to work wonders among you. Meaning that consecration uh, is a is a final step before possessing the land of promise. Before you step into your promise, there will often be a season of consecration, a season where God says, I want you to spend some extra time with me. I want you to listen to my voice. I want you to come away from some of the stuff that, that occupies your time. I want you to eliminate some distractions from your life. I want you to turn the TV off some and not spend all your time uh, uh, online, not spend all your time scrolling the internet, but I want you to have some time quiet in my presence. That will often be a time of consecration. It will often involve fasting. You got to fast uh, and, and spend time consecrating yourself in the presence of God so you can hear. Uh, and so there's a season of consecration. But when we get to Joshua 4, Joshua and the children of Israel did something key. As I said, I'm not going to be on too long because we're going to get ready to get to the part. Um, but I want to see a few things that they did with them. At the end of chapter three, we see that they took the Ark of the Covenant as they were getting ready to pass over, which means, and the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was a symbol of the manifest presence of God. So when you see the Ark, that means we're taking the presence of God with us. The first thing that you got to understand is when you're going to enter in and take and take possession of the land that God has given you and shown you, you got to know how to take God's presence with you. You got to know how to take the ark of God's presence. What does that mean? Don't go where God ain't going. Don't don't go where God ain't going. Listen, if God ain't there, I don't want to be there. If God is if God is not sanctioned it and leading in it, I don't want it I, because I don't want to just operate in something in my flesh. And God is saying, oh, that I don't have anything to do with that because where God guides, God provides. Uh, meaning that provision is that which God releases in favor of the vision. All right. So the first thing they did was they took God's presence with them. They carried the ark. And remember, the ark had to be carried on the shoulders of the priests or the Levites. The ark had to be carried by the right people, meaning you got to have the right people who are ushering you into the presence of God. You got to have the right people who are helping you connect with heaven and hear the sound of what God is saying and doing in this season. You got to have the right people. You got to have some Levites, people who know how to carry the presence of God, people who know how to get a prayer through. You got to have that. So the first thing they did was they invited the presence of God in through carrying the ark. All right. Um, notice they didn't just say, oh, we know how to fight. We got our weapons. We're going to go in. No, they said we got to have God first. God's got to go before us. The presence of the Lord has to prepare the way. Um, the scripture says in Zechariah, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. One of the mistakes we often make is we think we can handle stuff on our own. We think we can handle it in our flesh. We will we'll look at it and be, oh, I know, I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this. I can go out and make some stuff happen. That's a huge mistake because when you do that without God, without God's presence, without God's anointing, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure because you're saying, I can do this thing. And when, when you say you can do this thing on your own, God will step back and say, all right, you got it. Go for it. Go ahead. And you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up for destruction because God ordained it again, that we would collaborate. We would partner with God. So my question for, for many of you today is what is God calling you to partner with him in this season? Uh, what are the ways in which God is saying you got to partner with me? You got to. But one of the ways that we partner with God is that by believing. See, when you operate in doubt and unbelief, you negate partnership with God. You decide that you're not going to cooperate with God because God's responsibility is to declare the promise and to perform it. Our responsibility is to believe it. But if we refuse to believe the word of the Lord, if we refuse to believe what God says, that's why in Second Chronicles 20, when the when Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel were under attack, the word of the Lord came forth and they said, believe the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will prosper. When you do not operate from a place of faith and belief uh, and, and you decide to go anyway and go in unbelief, you're going to set yourself up for a loss. OK, uh, and so now he says here uh, that not only are we going to carry the ark with us, but when they go forward with the ark of the covenant, the other thing that they do in Joshua chapter four, and I want to encourage you to read that chapter in its entirety in your time, in your private time in Joshua four, 
they established and they set up 12 memorial stones or stones of remembrance, one for each of the 12 tribes, uh, meaning that as they were getting ready to go in, they wanted to make sure that no matter what happened over the years, they always set up a, a place to remember that God was the one that brought them in. And, and the scripture says that when they set up those stones, they said that it shall be when our children and grandchildren and our descendants ask, what do these stones mean? That they will tell them and they will say to them uh, in verse chapter four, verse 21, uh, then, spoke to, he to the, then he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. Because he's saying, listen, there's going to come a day in time when there's going to, your children, your descendants, your grandchildren, they're going to come along and they won't know what God did for you in this season. They, because they weren't there. They won't know and they won't remember how God brought you out. They won't remember and know how God made a way. They won't remember and know how God carried out his promise in your life. But these stones will be something that will be a physical reminder that when they ask, what are these stones? You can say, God brought us in on dry ground. Let me encourage you that in your life, you got to set up some stones of remembrance. Somebody type in the comment section, remembrance. You got to set up some stones of remembrance uh, in your family. What are the stones of remembrance that you have in your life, in your family, where people who look at your life can say, what does this mean? And you say, it's a reminder of what God did. You got to have some stones of remembrance that that uh, and this is important for especially for those of you who have children and grandchildren. Um, many times they know that you are a person of faith, but they don't know all of what God did for you. That's why you should not be ashamed of your testimony. You should not be ashamed. Listen, don't be ashamed of where God brought you from. Uh, that your children and grandchildren need to hear the testimony of where God brought you from. You know, one of the things that's funny to me is sometimes the older saints or the seasoned saints, um, sometimes it looks like they've just been been saved and Holy Ghost filled all their life. And and when you look at, I used to look at some of the old saints in church and, and be like, oh, they, they must have just been saved and praying all day for, for 50, 60, 70 years. But as I got older and heard some of their testimonies and stories, they were a mess too. And, and the fact of the matter is, they had some stones of remembrance in their life that let people know, oh, no, I haven't always been like this. I haven't always been a, a prayer warrior. I haven't always been godly. I haven't always been consecrated. I got some stones of remembrance that let that remind me of what God did and how God brought me out. And because I set up these stones of remembrance that I can tell people, listen, this is what God did. What are the stones of remembrance that you have set up in your life? Uh, what are the things that are a reminder of how God moved, how God changed you, how God transformed you? Um, there are some things that I have that, that remind me of what God did in past seasons of my life. And I keep those things as a reminder so that no matter how far God takes me in life, I always remember it's the Lord's doing, that God is the one that did this thing. You got to set up the stones of remembrance. Now watch this. They set up the stones of remembrance before they took control of the land. So they set up the stones of remembrance because they crossed on dry ground, even though they hadn't taken all the land yet. You got to set up a memorial to God. And I'm not, not necessarily a physical memorial, but you got to decide, God, even before I see the full victory, I'm going to position myself that I will always be grateful for what you're doing. I'm going to posture myself that I will always have a, a heart of gratitude. You know, there was a study years ago, uh, and I don't remember what university did it, that um, that showed that one of the ways to decrease anxiety was through expressing gratitude and thankfulness and, and gratefulness. What are the, what's important about that is that when you operate from a place of gratitude, uh, your anxiety will diminish. See, many of us, we're so anxious and stressed out about what hasn't happened, the prayer that hasn't been answered, the door that has not opened yet, the things that have not come forth yet. Um, and we get so anxious about those things. We get so anxious about many things, but we don't remember to look back and thank God for what he has already done. 
You know, uh, there's an old saying that said, thank you makes room for more. That's why Psalm 100 says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into God's courts with praise. The first step to entering the presence of God is thank thanksgiving and gratitude. Uh, one of the worst things that you can encounter is ungrateful people. As a matter of fact, you don't like people that are ungrateful in the natural. When you do something for somebody and they don't say thank you, uh, people who act like you owe them something or uh, act like you just did nothing for them, that makes you upset. How do you think God feels when we treat him as if we're not grateful? How does it make God feel to see our lack of gratitude, our lack of honor, and our lack of thanksgiving? All right. So they set up stones of remembrance. They set up a place where they could intentionally remember what God did and how God showed up on their behalf. Uh, and the other thing that they did was after they set up these stones of remembrance, uh, they, they, they said, we're going to remind the next generation of what God did. But not only would they remind the next generation of what God did, but when we get to Ch Joshua chapter five, the scripture says that Joshua had to, there was a, a the, the warriors who were going to fight with them uh, were not the people who came out of Egypt, meaning that there was a whole new generation in the army that under Joshua. Joshua and Caleb were the OGs. They were the seniors. They were they were the the old men who were who had been there and done it and seen it all. But there was a group of young fighting men that weren't alive and weren't born when they came out of Egypt. And so Joshua, the Bible says in Joshua five, he had to circumcise them, meaning that there was a, a next generation that had to be circumcised. Now I'm not going to go into the, the depths of all of what circumcision is, but there's a spiritual implication to circumcision, because circumcision involves cutting away the foreskin of the flesh. And there is a, a the scripture refers to a circumcision of the heart and and in the spirit your heart has to be circumcised before god because sometimes there's too much flesh around your heart too much flesh that's in your life and god has to cut away some of your flesh and your carnality and, and, and some of your behavior patterns and some of your attitudes and some of your mindsets there is a spiritual circumcision that that god will do in your life and and before you can cross over because Joshua said, oh, no, we can't have you go in without being circumcised because the circumcision was the right of remembrance that Israel had, that every time the men went to the bathroom or anything, they remembered the covenant they had with God. And so you got to have your heart circumcised before God, meaning the cutting away of the flesh. What is the flesh? The flesh is your sin nature. The flesh is your carnal side. It is the part of you that is always trying to rebel against God, always seeking to disobey God not keeping the commands of the Lord. There's a circumcision of the heart that has to happen. Joshua says, listen, this generation hasn't been circumcised. They, they didn't receive what we received when they came out of Egypt. There's a generation right now that doesn't have the circumcision of heart. The, 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 you know, the, 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 there's a previous generation of people of God who knew how to fast. We got to make sure this generation knows what it means to fast. It's not just outdated. It's not just outmoded that we just need to throw it away. No, you got, we got to circumcise the hearts of this next generation so that they will know fasting and praying and spending time in your word is not just something that is old fashioned, but it is something that the Lord requires of us. We got to do this thing now because we got to cut away the flesh because your flesh will send you off. Your flesh will lead you astray. Your flesh will put you in a place of destruction. Your flesh will distract you. It will pull you away from God and not draw you closer to God. And so you got to cut away the parts of your flesh that could make a that could cause disruptions for you and keep you out of the promise of God. And you got to make sure that this generation is circumcised in their hearts and their soul. And so they had the circumcision of the hearts that they were going to do uh, that they were going to have. And they decided, listen. Uh, Joshua says, I got to cut you uh, because watch this. True leadership will cut you sometime. Let me say that again. Good leadership, godly leadership will cut you sometime. My goal as a leader is not to make you feel good all the time. There are going to be some things that I'll say that may cut you and that may feel uncomfortable and that may bring conviction. And that's okay. Because all that means is God is cutting away part of your flesh. God is, is, is God is consecrating a part of your heart. God is removing some stuff in you that ought not to be there. If you never have any cutting, God can't use you. If there's never something that God says, I got to cut this out your life, 
that and and this might is it may not be a habit or it may not be a sin physically it could be a mindset it could be an attitude it could be a pattern of thinking but what you have to do is cut away the parts of your flesh that will hinder you from god and destroy your destiny because when whether you realize it or not unchecked flesh will keep you out of the promises of god unchecked flesh can dismantle and destroy your destiny you can you can sabotage your future because you didn't crucify your flesh because you didn't deal with stuff that god told you to deal with so so he circumcised this next generation he he, he decided i gotta cut their hearts and then the last thing that we see that happened as they were as they started to cross over and watch this when they got to the ground that that they were called to joshua chapter 5 verse 12 uh i'm sorry verse 11 and they ate of the produce of the land on the day after passover unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day verse 12. then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land and the children of israel no longer had manna but they ate the food of the land of canaan that year watch this they hadn't finished taking over all the land but because they had stepped into the place because they had stepped into the land the manna ceased now why is this important let me i'm gonna unpack this and then we're gonna be done the manna ceased because the manna uh if you don't know what manna is manna was like little wafers that would literally rain down from heaven the whole time the children of israel were in the wilderness uh the manna was like a, a wafer and they ate it that was their food every day the scripture says in the wilderness he would rain manna and he gave them quail so they had they had food they had sustenance now did they always enjoy the manna not necessarily because part sometimes they get tired of the manna but what what the manna teaches us that god always provides manna was a symbol of supernatural provision let me say that one more time somebody type in the comment section supernatural provision the manna was a symbol from god of how he supernaturally provided for them in the wilderness because in the wilderness they couldn't grow their own crops they couldn't farm and they couldn't produce their own stuff they had to rely on god to supply and meet their needs and some of you have been in a season or have been in situations where you couldn't produce stuff on your own you you couldn't make some stuff happen with your own hand you had to rely on god to provide for you you had to rely on God to supply your needs. And so what happened is you needed manna from heaven. It may not have been a physical manna, but God provided for you in some way or another. Manna was the supernatural supply of God to sustain them in their wilderness season. And some of you have had manna. You've had the supernatural supply of God. You've had the Lord provide some things for you and supply some things for you that you needed in that season and God gave you what you needed for that season but watch this when that season was up and God had provided a way for you to supply the, to get the needs met in the natural maybe God gave you a new job maybe God um put you in a new position the manna ceased so you no longer needed the supernatural provision because you were able to provide with your hands then so manna is never meant to be permanent it is for the season that god is supernaturally supplying for you and but here's the thing when they got into the land of promise they hadn't fully taken it all over but as soon as they got into the land they were able to eat from the land can i say this to some of you god is causing you to walk in a place and god is giving you the experience in this season that you're stepping into your land of promise and if it seems like the supernatural supply of god has diminished or or is cut off or slowed down maybe it's because you're stepping into some stuff that you've never stepped into before maybe it's because you don't need the supernatural supply anymore because god is giving you ways in the natural to get your needs met see when your needs are met in the natural god doesn't have to do supernatural supply he doesn't have to release supernatural provision supernatural provision it's only needed when natural provision is not available. Let me say that one more time. Supernatural provision is only needed when natural provision is not an option. 
So when natural provision is not an option, God will release supernatural supply. But when supernatural supply is no longer needed, God will stop it. And the scripture says that year they began to eat from the produce of the land. They started eating from the land as soon as they stepped in. And God says, all right, you're stepping into the land of promise. You don't need the manna anymore. It is, it is just like when your child learns how to walk. You don't have to carry them all the time. Right? You carried them when they were a little baby because they couldn't physically walk. But when they began to learn to walk on their own, you didn't have to carry them. You could hold them by the hand. Can I say this to some of y'all? You're moving into a season where God won't always have to carry you. He'll just hold you by the hand. Now, he's not going to let you go. See, with your child, you didn't totally release them and let them go yet. You held them by the hand because you want to make sure that they didn't run off, get hit by a car or get in something they didn't need to get into. So you were still guiding them and protecting them and nurturing them. But you held them by the hand. So what does that mean? You gave them a measure of independence, but you didn't totally release them from your care. Woo, thank you. Hold it. Go. Let me say that one time. You gave them a measure of independence, but you didn't fully release them from your care. And that's what God is doing for some of you in this season. He's not carrying you anymore the way he used to. He's simply guiding you by the hand. So he's guiding you and directing you, but you have more independence. You can stand on your own now. You can walk a little better now. So God is giving you strength to, to re reach into some stuff and to make provision for yourself. He'll still guide you by the hand, though. So they ate from the produce of the land, but the manna ceased. The manna stopped. Meaning that the supernatural supply was gone because the natural provision was then able to be made. And that's what God did for them. I'm going to stick a pin here and I'm going to pause um, because I believe that many of, of us are stepping into promises. I've been declaring all this month that we are stepping into the new. We're moving into the new season. This is a season. And, and let me just say this. I know we've talked about new seasons before. But for somebody, I want to declare to you and prophesy over your life, it's not going to be like other seasons. Some of you have dealt with disappointment because you said, well, God, I was hoping that it would be different that time and it didn't work out and it didn't happen. This is the season to try it again. There are places in which you failed before. There are places in which you were disappointed before. But this is the time. Well, God has given you a new wind, a second wind to get up and try again. Get up and go after it another time, a second time. You felt last time, but you won't fail this time because this is the season of God moving you from where you were to where he's calling you to be. There is a new beginning for you in this season. And God has assured you, your, God has assured you in this season that you're not going alone. There's some of you that God has already assured your success in this season. He's already assured your provision. He's already assured the doors that have been made. I've been I've been kind of in this vein in some of my uh, lives uh, throughout the week. I'm going to continue in this vein, but because I believe that God is releasing instructions and strategy in this season. So I'm going to pause here. Uh, but two things I want to do before we get off of here. Uh, if there's somebody watching and you're not in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not in a covenant with God. You can decide today that you want to take a step of faith and encounter the Lord Jesus. Uh, message us, connect with us. We want to usher you into that thing. Secondly, uh, we want to worship the Lord in our giving. Um, and we're going to do that and prepare to, uh, to give. Those of you who uh, want to give today, um, there's several different ways that you can do that. I'm going to put the options to give on the screen. Uh, if you want to give electronically, you can go to our website at nhccc.org that's nhccc.org if you have the app givelify you can give at new hope covenant church on givelify uh, if you have the new hope app you can give at new hope covenant church uh, uh give to the new hope app you can have there's a give option on the app uh you if you want to mail your offering to us you can mail it to new hope covenant church uh chicago that's p.o box 87320 chicago illinois 
zip code 60680. Uh, those who want to sell love offering to me, you can do so to my cash app. That's dollar sign Quentin Mumphrey. Uh, if you want to sell love offering to me personally, uh, my cash app is dollar sign Quentin Mumphrey. I want to give you all a moment to prepare your seed as we prepare to worship the Lord in our giving. Um, I'll give you a moment to that to do that. All right. All right, let's lift up our seat before the Lord as we declare our, our promise, right? I'm a tither and a giver. I am blessed above measure. I have more than enough. I'm living in my overflow. I'm out of debt. All my needs are met, and I have plenty more to put in store. I want you to declare this out of your mouth. This is the season of restoration, of restitution, and recompense. I am the favorite of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all, listen. I'm going to get up out of here because I got to get to the park. Listen, remember, if you're in Chicago, meet us at 5575 Lakeshore Drive um, for pop-up prayer. We're going to be there at 12 noon. So in 15 minutes, meet me in the park. We're going to be there. We're going to pray, and then we're going to have lunch, um, and we're going to just connect and just have some time together. All right, y'all. Uh, until next time, remember, rivers are flowing that no one can stop. Dams are breaking that no one can prevent. And doors are opening that no one can shut. Something good is going to happen to you. I declare it over your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, in-person worship, first Sunday in September, uh, Sunday, September 4th. Uh, today we're in the park. But in-person worship, Sunday, September 4th, first Sunday. And in the meantime, look for me in my pop-ups. I'll be doing some lives this week and, and the coming weeks both here on Instagram. I'll see y'all real soon. God bless you. Have a great day. I'm going to see y'all in the park.